Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, a psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Bonnie Weiss as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential therapists so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Bonnie is an internal family systems clinician, teacher and supervisor. She's taught classes and workshops on IFS, working with the inner critic, beyond eating and developing self-esteem. She's the author of the Self-Therapy Workbook, the illustrated workbook for freedom from your inner critic, activating your inner champion, and with Jay Early, freedom from your inner critic, letting go of perfectionism. Bonnie was also a director and faculty member of the Result Center of Long Island for 20 years. Excited to have you here today, Bonnie. Thanks, lovely. I know, that, I know that's a sort of abbreviated version of your lengthy career, but... Um, in the interest of time, I'd love to jump in. Jump. Um, so yeah, you, so you specialize in, in IFS mm -hmm. and how do you uh, consider that to be experiential? Like what about it makes it experiential? Everything about it. <laughs> Every, everything about it because it's, it's really a right brain therapy. So um, <clears throat> you're working with the imaginal body. The, um, I'm very... Um, heavily somatic in my work. Uh, so I'm working with visualization, imagination, and somatic awareness all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. IFS is, um, IFS is, uh, um, do you want me to tell you what IFS is? Or do we just assume people know what IFS is? Oh, yeah, sure. I'd love to hear from you what, how you conceptualize it. That'd be great. Well, let me show you, I can show you how I teach it. It's about, it takes about two minutes, but it's actually, <laughs> it, I think it's the clearest way to teach IFS. Okay, here we go. It's Bonnie's, this is my little IFS dance, okay? So a client comes into your office, you know, and they say, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm angry, I've got OCD, you know, I've got interpersonal relationship issues, you know, so this is me and this is what I come in with. And what we do in IFS is we say, that's not you, that depression, that anxious, that angry, you know, that's not you. It's just a part of you. And that we can actually ask that part of you to, to move over or give you some space because the real you, what we call an IFS self is back here. So as we help a client see that they are, they that what they bring is just a part, they can get some space from it. And the work in IFS is actually for you, that real essential self, to develop this relationship with this part. So the beautiful thing about IFS is that it flips the therapeutic alliance, whereas where most of us are used to having the therapist be the attachment object and the, and the relationship between the therapist and the client be the primary focus of the therapy. In IFS, the healing relationship is actually between you and your parts. And so you become the primary attachment figure for your part. I can go on. Shall I go on? Whole... Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's wonderful. What an empowering thing to have an assumption of you, the client has this innate self, which can right. be in relationship to these parts that maybe are scary or terrifying. But yeah, please go on. So so in IFS, this, the, the, the IFS process, which is this amazing process and is just like it's burgeoning all over the world. I mean, I think it's like a 10,000 people waiting list all over the in, internationally to get into the IFS training. People are just really, really getting it. So IFS, this isn't you, it's a part of you. This is the relationship that is the healing relationship. And as I get to know this part, one of the IFS questions is, how do I feel towards this part? You know, so let's say this part is my anger. I'm angry and I, my anger gets me in trouble. I'm having fights with my husband. I'm losing my job. I'm angry. Okay, so I'm getting to know my anger. So in the process of getting to know my anger, one of the IFS questions is, how do I feel towards this anger? I hate my anger. 
that's not me hating my anger. That's just another part of me. And we can get that part that hates my anger to move away. And then we go back to how do I feel towards my anger? Well, I'm actually afraid of it. I'm afraid it's going to really get me in trouble. And that's just another part, the fear. And we just kind of unblend. That's an IFS word, unblend from these parts. We call them concern parts. Until we get down to the point where I ask, how do I feel towards this part? And I'm either curious about it. I really don't understand it. And then I'm in this place called self or um, I see who it is and I feel compassion for it. And then I'm also in self. And as I spend time getting to know this part, what this part will say, I, I do this, <clears throat> whatever it is, anger, depression, OCD, whatever it is, <laughs> because I'm really protecting a younger part. We call these parts protectors. And what's behind it are these younger parts called exiles. And as I get to know this part, it will allow me to meet this exile, which is hurt or fear or lack of value or abandonment. And as I get to know this exile part, <clears throat> go through the same kind of process, how do I feel towards it? I'm afraid of it. I'm terrified. That can move. I hate it. I'm embarrassed by it. That can move. And then I actually get curious or compassionate and then go through this five-step process to heal this exile. And then go back, <clears throat> pardon me, and then once that exile is healed, I can go back to this protecting part and say, do you see that I've healed this exile part? It's not holding that burden of the history. Do you still need to do your job? Do you still need to be angry, depressed, anxious, whatever? And this part can say, you know what, I can let go of that role. And that's basically IFS. Wow. So really, it's like, it sounds like you're you're guiding the client to do to be the therapist for themselves. And you have to be listening out like, is this, are they responding to their parts from self? Or is there another part that's getting in the way? Right? Yeah. And as the therapist, your work is is almost like the coach of their self. And your work is to be in yourself. So your work is to be in that highest place. You know, we talk about the eight C's in IFS of compassion, curiosity, caring, courage, clarity, you know, there's eight more, but, you know, so those are the qualities of self. And so the therapist holds those qualities and um, provides the client with the support from self to be themselves. Wow. Yeah. So you're really having to, when you're with a client and you know, if you notice an anxious part or a fearful part come up, you have to kind of tend to that to, to right. get back to self, to be able to exactly. tend to the client, to get them into self. Right. So the whole whole process is really, you can see it's experiential I in think. every way from the moment you right. set in, which is wonderful. Um, and then you're guiding the client in self to heal the exile Right. Pause. The healing goes on inside the client, not so much the the therapist holds the space, mm -hmm. um, but the healing is really within the client and it teaches the clients tools that they can use outside of the therapeutic um, structure. Does, does IFS ever require the therapist to talk directly to a part of a client that maybe is like resistant to stepping aside or? Yeah, yeah, it, it, we do. Um it's a, it's a practice called direct access. And when you do it, so if you have a part that won't unblend or is giving, or, or there isn't enough self there, the therapist may ask the client, can I talk to this part? You know, you know, can I talk to your anger? But when you do talk to their anger, it's really a triad. You don't just knock out the person. It's like, so I'll be talking to the client's anger and I'll keep looking at the client and saying, did you hear that? Are you aware of that? Because, it's, because in doing that, the client will pick it up and then I can back off, you know? So yes, sometimes you could wind up doing a whole, I could wind up doing a whole session with the client's anger, but my goal is to really be there and kind of lend myself to the client's self until it kind of activates and then I can step back and let the client be 
in connection with it, with their own part. Wow, yeah, it's so empowering to have to, yeah. to be trusting of like the client, you're gonna do this healing right. work to yourself. Right. You mm-hmm. can do this. Right. Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, I saw go oh. on. No, because because they have a self and they and and it's just a question of like kind of like unblending from all those parts that are in the way that are occluding that self until they really get it, get a sense. And that's where the somatic is so important because every feeling that you have starts out as a somatic um, impulse. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always bringing the client back to the body, back to the body, back to the body, because every time you have an exchange, something shifts in here. And the more that you can help the client be aware of those minor somatic shifts, the more they are in touch with themselves, aware and embodied. You know, I talk about parts as having each part having their own very subtle somatic profile. You know, mm-hmm. so I help mm-hmm. the clients find what is really the somatic profile of that part. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a little froggy this morning. What, you know, where, like, where are the subtle ways your anger holds? Where does your hopelessness live in your body? You know, where does that OCD or that perfectionism, you know, hold? So wow. Getting- so you, and really like along the way, nudging them back to that, by would you, by saying like, where, how is it now to be yep. that part? Or like, yep. where is that now? What just changed, right? What just changed? What's here in your body now? So that it's not, it's not just a mental experience. It's a, it's a, it's an embodied um, a live, vibrant experience. Yeah, yeah. Really, again, it just sounds experiential the whole time. It and I, I guess I had a question about that. If you're, do you ever have clients who really perhaps struggle to identify the part in their system, and it's like really just they're like, well, I just, I know it's there because I'm thinking about it. Does that make right. sense? Yeah, it makes sense a lot. Well, you know. People come to me for IFS, so I don't run in. I don't run into that these days that much, but I teach all the time, so I hear that question all the time. So, you know, one of the first things that that you notice with some people is is they have a very strong thinking part, and if you can identify the thinker, you know, and I'm and I'm very accepting of the thinker. What I'll say to somebody is, you have a great thinker, you know, and that thinker has been there all your life. And I'm sure he or she has saved you, um, has has saved your life and has helped you get wherever you are today. And I'm sure you're really grateful to that thinking part. And I wonder if just for a moment, we could ask that thinker to just take a little step to the side and see what that's like. And most people can do that. Well, so, um, I mean, if that can happen, that's great. I, I, I'm, I wonder. Um, I wonder. Though, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about. You know, I'm, I live in Austin, Texas. There's a, there's a big tech scene here. A lot of people are like really smart in their heads, yeah. logical yeah. people, right. and knocking them into this type of experience can perhaps be challenging. Or for some people, like, what do you even mean? Where do I feel it down here? I only feel it up here. Right. You know, do you do you just keep going and say, well, you know, you you um, you always have to meet people where they're at. And you don't ever try to impose your excitement on somebody. People come to you because they want help and they have a certain concept of help. Maybe they've been to other therapists and they know that just talking, talking can help. So you meet people where they're at and you can just subtly begin to, if you use, if you use parts language, so so this is more what would I teach these days than what I do because I don't really see these people. But but I hold IFS as the way the psyche is structured, you know. So if I'm getting a protector part and I can't get that protector part to unblend, I I know that as strong as that protector is, that's as fragile as that exile is behind it. So if you have a very, very traumatized or fragile exile, you're going to have a very strong protector. So it's the way I understand things. And then I move from there. But I'm never trying to make the client 
do what I want him to do. I'm just trying to meet him. So we can be talking and we can be, he can be telling me his story. And then I can say, you know, it sounds like there's a part when you got that thing from your boss. It sounds like there was a part that got really angry. And then it sounds like there was a part that didn't feel valued. And I suspect there was also a part that got a little scared, you know, and they can say yes or no. The The concept of parts is it comes from um, the client's language. You know, Dick Schwartz is the developer of this system and he was working um, in an, he, he was a family systems person and he was working in a, in an inpatient unit with um with uh, with young women, I think mostly who were anorectic and suicidal and self-harming, you know, and it came from the language came from uh, the clients who would say, you know, I have this part of me that wants to be skinny and pretty and a part of me that wants to eat everything in sight or a part of me that wants to be really successful and a part of me that wants to stay in bed all day. So this whole concept of parts came from clients language. So clients understand it. And they may not say like, I don't want to talk to my thing, you know, but, but people can understand. And if you know a client and you're introducing it, you can say, you know, sounds like that, that's an angry part of you. And they can say, no, I'm angry or I'm depressed. And you can say, yeah, I, I know that it feels that way, but I know you. And I know that that anger is here sometimes, but I also know you're a really good dad and you're a really, you know, devoted husband and you're a, you are, are a hard worker. And those are other parts of you too. And the anger is here, but it's not all of you. You know, and people, when you see and value who they are, they get it that whatever they bring is just a piece of them. It's not the whole story. Yeah, and I'm sure that's such a relief for a lot of people who may identify as depressed, anxious, right. to be right. like, oh, this is just a part, like what a sort of it's very deep pathologizing right as having different parts and right. and they all and they always sounds like if you get to an exile it, they make sense on some level they're coherent it isn't a pathology it's like a, oh this part has shown up to protect this exile and the guy in the back right who's hurt or yeah rejected right yeah get it. yeah that's so great and you're, so, and you're absolutely right is that when people, because people come in with whatever problem they have and they have pathologized it and they have parts that hate it because they know that everybody in their life hates it and they hate it. And if you can say, you know, it sounds like you have this angry part that gets you in trouble. And it sounds like you have a lot of parts, critical parts, rejecting parts inside that hate this part, just like the people in your life, you know? but they're all just parts of you. It's not who you are. It's a relief for people. And when you work with couples, you know, to be able to have people, um, you know, who get angry at each other, he's this way and she's this way. And to be able to say, it's just a part of him. It's just a part of her. You know, she, she loves you. He loves you. He's devoted to the family. She's the greatest mom, you know? And then she's got this part that, you know, gets pissed if you leave your clothes on the floor or don't put away the dishes, you know? And it's like, oh, right. I can love my husband or I can love my wife and be like really pissed at that bitchy, naggy part, you know, or that sloppy, you know, irresponsible part. But that's not who he is, you know? It's a relief for people. Yeah, I feel relieved. <laughs> um, I had a question about, okay, so someone comes in and they like have this anxious part or this angry part and you do the work and you, you get to the exile and you do the unburdening. Does that often, more often than not, eradicate the symptom altogether? You know, the presenting problem? Well, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. We, you know, my my partner Jay Early and I have been doing a lot of thinking about this recently. Because Dick Schwartz, thirty years ago when we were trained, you know, his his attitude was like one and done. If you get to the protector, you be the protector, you heal the exile. If it comes up again, it's another exile. But I think what we're what we're finding is with with all of the the stuff we know about the brain is that 
is that the, these new neural connections um, take take a little while to, to hook. You know, it's this thing about memory reconsolidation. You know, so memory reconsolidation is. Shall I do? Shall I go into it? Give a quickie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. So something bad happened. Okay. Something bad happened. And I have the part that holds the trauma of it, you know, and then I remember, oh my God, something bad happened. And then something bad happened. Every time I remember it on some level, I'm re-experiencing the trauma and it feels like I'm remembering the original one, but I'm not. I'm remembering the last time I remembered it. That's what that neural track is. So if I then go into something bad happened and somebody was there, you know, self was there being compassionate, or I went through a healing process, I was heard and I was understood, I was brought out of the past, I was unburdened, then the next time I remember it, I remember something bad happened and somebody was there and something better happened, something healing happened. So what we're finding is that after you heal in exile, um, it's important to make a contract with it to go back and just remind it who you are so that at the end of the work, we'll, we'll say to the exile, what do you what do you need from me? And they'll probably say, well, just check in with me every week. Or when you sit down to meditate in the morning, just put a little picture of me on your meditation table or on your refrigerator or your car visor and just keep that contact with me so that you're always kind of refreshing, you know, whoops, refreshing. Something bad happened, but I, I got healed. I got saved. I got moved out of the past. And the more you do that, the, the trauma starts, it starts to fade. Mm. So by so by revisiting where the exile is stuck, perhaps, and, and being in self, and so the exile is no longer alone in that, that's like the reconsolidation. Like this terrible thing happened, but actually now... I'm with you in self. I'm with you here. And 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 I can tell you the five there's a five step healing process in IFS. You know, so once you get to this exile, the process is the first step is witnessing. Every exile wants to tell you his his or her story, you know. So they really have always, you know, they've been stuck back there by this protector who's so afraid of them but they want to tell you their story. So just listening to the story of what really happened and knowing as the person that the exile can hold memories that you don't have. You know, like we all have the story about our childhood, good or bad, but it's it's what we remember. You know, narrative therapy points to that where you just, um, you know, where there are certain instances out of all the instances we've lived through, we kind of hook, we pick, you know, a number of them and link them up. And that's our story. You know, when you get to the exile, you will find that there's probably stories or memories that you're not aware of. So the exile wants his story, his or her story to be told. So there's witnessing. And then you can go back and you can do what we call reparenting or redo, where the self can go back into the childhood with that exile and redo something you know it might be talk to the talk to the parent and say this is what my experience was or get that abuser off of me or um i mean i have a couple stories i can tell you you know if you want but and go back and redo an incident in childhood so that you can literally relink that old experience into a new image and um narrative of what happened okay and then the next piece is to take that exile out of the past the exile is always living in the past so it's that's where it gets triggered so if you retrieve it is the ifs word you bring it out of the past into the present and then we see the exile not as the problems you know the exile is this sweet innocent pure child that was born where something bad happened and it took on what we call a burden, which would be negative beliefs or memories or somatic memories. And those are the burdens on this innocent child. So this process of unburdening, of just sending, we do it, we do it in um, a shamanic ritual of, you know, taking it out of the body and giving it to 
one of the elements or giving it to God or Buddha or Jesus or throwing it over the horizon, just releasing what has been taken on on that innocent child and unburdening it and then taking in qualities to replace that burden. So that's that whole process. Wow, that's so fascinating. So you're really connecting with the exile part, hearing it out, giving it space to say, this is what happened. Right. And then you understand, do you, so you try and elicit what it means about it, that this stuff happened. Like it probably has beliefs about itself that it was treated it as- about itself because of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? yeah. My mother then, always rejected me for my brother. So I must be bad. There must be something wrong with me or I don't have, or I have to be perfect. I have to be smart. I can't be messy. You know, nobody wanted me, whatever, you know, whatever that is that, that you believe impacts the way that you think about yourself and impacts your body. You know, I should be small. I should be invisible. I mm. should be perfect. You know. Does an exile, if you're, if your clients in self and it's, it's witnessing this and hearing from the part and the self says to the exile part, well, the truth is you're not all of those things or mm -hmm. these these there's, there's these are the qualities you actually have does yet could an exile part ever go i can't believe that or that's not true or it, it certainly could be you know but um i think as you know there's there's something about about the relationship um the relationship to the protector but the relationship with the exile where it literally feels somebody there you know, it feels, and, and you hear from exiles all the time, you know, like nobody ever wanted to know. Nobody was ever interested. And sometimes you get, you know, like, I don't trust you. You weren't there when I was small. Why should I trust you now? You know, and so you have to help the client self say, you're absolutely right. When you were small, I was small. You know, I, I was, I, I came to protect you when you were two, three, four, five, six, and I had the capacities of somebody who was two, three, four, five, six. So we do a lot of updating with, um, with the parts, updating where as you start to work in this process of getting to know, you check how old the part thinks you are. You know, Sometimes self comes in and they think some nice lady just stopped by and they have no idea who it is. So you have to, you have to say, this is me, this is this is the grown up you. And in the years, in the 30, 40, 50, 60 years since um, I was small like you, here's what I've learned. Here's the experiences I've had and I've lived through. Here's the wisdom I've gained. Here's the support I have. Here's the freedom I have. And once the parts kind of see who you are, they trust you. OK, and in that trust, then as I, which which now has a little bit more heft and clarity in the system, as I am interested in this part, just like any of us, it starts to feel its own capacity, you know? Oh, so if you value me, you know, <laughs> I must be worth something, you know? So it's in that healing relationship between the self and the part, just like a child. Like if you take, if you take a little child and you pay good attention to it and you value it and you appreciate it, it, in, it in integrates those uh, reflections of itself into that, that identity of who I am. So it happens, in, it's a relational thing. It happens in the relationship. So they can start out saying, no, you know, my mother didn't want me. My parents said, well, I was an accident, blah, blah, blah. I'm worthless. But in this healing relationship with self, you know, and that I am interested, I am compassionate, I do care about you, I do see your value, you know, that 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 gets absorbed into that exile. Yeah, it's like I can hear you talking about the reconsolidation, you know, like the kids, like I was this way and that way and I was alone and no one cared. And then suddenly it's like shifting to, oh, but now I have this person in self who's seeing me as this other thing. Right. And I imagine the brain like just updating. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll upload that data. Right. Yeah. 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 You it's said you had, um, go on. Sorry. What did you say? I said it's beautiful to watch. It's just, yeah. Beautiful. I was going to, I was going to, 
I was going to ask, I know you said you had a couple of um, stories about this. Like, I wonder I if know, this... I just, I was just, I just read your list this morning. I said stories. I mean, I can just, I can do, you know, three come to mind and just one just happened last week, but, but I, I just got back from Australia. I was in Australia. I was in Melbourne for a month. And um, I, when I, when I talk about this process of redoing, you know, going back and going into the scene and redoing. I always tell this story because it, because it was just the sweetest story of something that happened in in Melbourne about five years ago, where uh, I was working with this young man, and he um, it was something about uh, he, he had a terrible coach, you know, at on a baseball thing, and um, he was feeling awful about himself. And so we went back and we took out the, the awful coach and we put in his dad who was really supportive, you know? And so, you know, his dad was there and was going to help him play baseball. And so at the end, you know, you say to that, you, you redo the scene and have him take in those qualities. And then you say to the exile, you know, you don't have to live in the past anymore where you feel so bad about yourself. You, you can come out of the past and into the present, you know? And so I said to this little boy, so do you want to come into the present? You don't have to stay back there. And he just looked at me and he said, no, I just want to play ball, <laughs> you know? And it's such a cute little story. So I, I usually tell that story when I teach. And so I told the story and then at, at the lunch break, um, I was teaching at a university in, in Melbourne and, a, and a, a, a bunch of people very generously who I had taught years before came to assist me. And so this man who, who was, had come to assist said to me, we went for a walk and he said, you know, that was my story. And I said, I didn't remember that it was, you. <laughs> you know, he said, that was my work. I said, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he said, no, he said, you know, he said, about then that was like five years ago and he said about four years ago I woke up one morning and I said I want to play baseball and he said and I've been I'm gonna cry and he said and I've been playing baseball every Saturday for the past four years and it's been just the best thing of my life and he said I never hooked it up to that work so it was such a sweet mm -hmm. such a sweet thing you know of that of where really where that healing goes Wow, so moving. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. That he went back and he was like, I just want to play ball. And then he didn't even realize that he was stepping into playing ball again. Right. It took a year. And then he woke up one morning. He said, I want to play baseball. And he said, and every week I play baseball. And he said, I never hooked it up. It was sweet. Sweet. Wow. Wow. So, um, so profound. And I, as, I'm, as you're telling this story too, I, I'm imagining it's not a case of just thinking about um, the coach being your dad now it's like really uh, uh, embodying the experience of like, okay yeah yeah well I was, I was yeah I was thinking like I think it's easy in your mind to go to a place like oh yeah I just imagine this image of my now my dad's the coach but I, I imagine in IFS it's it's more sort of slowed down like okay so you're there who does he want the coach to be or who would be someone better like really slowing down in that process absolutely right? Yeah, right. And what does it feel like? And what does he say? And what does it feel like for you? And again, it's relational. So now you're there with this dad, you know, and right, you just want to play ball because now you've got the support that you need. And it's and, and it gets integrated into that sense of who you are instead of like, I'm a klutz, I'm, you know, stupid, I can't do this, you know. Mm -hmm. so it gets integrated on a very deep level which is not left brain it's right brain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah do you ever find I mean I'm, I'm just thinking about times where the work maybe feels stuck or like you've done some of the kind of unburdening and it feels like things haven't really shifted like is your sense ever that people are having a left brain experience but they're thinking it's right brain and that's why the process isn't doing what it should or like I think, you know, the other thing that we've been, Jay and I have just been doing a lot of thinking about this recently is, um, is, is not only, and, and this is, hasn't been part of IFS, but it's kind of what I, what we're doing now is 
you go and you heal the exile and we've we've learned over the years you know even dick says now you know like you have to go back you have to do homework you have to reconnect the self to the exile but um we've also been thinking a lot about the protector you know so that you have this like let's say this angry protector and he's been angry ever since you've been five you know and that's the way he's handled things and it reminds me of people I've worked with who've been in program, you know, so that if somebody has a drinking thing and they start drinking when they're nine or 10, and then every single time anything gets tense, they drink. So they go into AA and they dry up and they're 50, you know, and so now they don't drink anymore. But the coping skills and the ways of managing interpersonal relating is still the, the the capacity of a 10 year old, you know, so that it, so that what we're finding is that sometimes you do all the process, but people are still eating the cookies or drinking the thing or getting angry. And then you have to work a little bit with this protector to be able to like, like if it's an angry protector to teach it how to set boundaries, teach it how to walk away, teach it how to say no, teach it how to be assertive instead of aggressive. So there may be skills needed, even though the protector will say, okay, great, I won't do that anymore because I'm not protecting that exile. You know, it may need some coaching in terms of the, the skills that it didn't develop over those years because it was getting angry or drinking or whatever those things were. Mm, so, so, so in that case, like self is kind of 10, year, 10 years old emotionally or in some, on some well, way. Well, the protector is 10 years old. Self, self doesn't have an age. Okay. But, but the protector is is 10 and so this is where the therapist comes in we where, where you kind of switch a little bit to coaching about teaching somebody you know how to set a boundary how to say no how to how to be um assertive and not aggressive what's the language um so yeah it, that it, makes a lot of sense what's the shift mm -hmm. and is there a way that the therapist will still make that work experiential well, you know, that you, you can say, take a stand with me, you know, tell me something you don't like about me, you know, tell me to stop, you know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I ran a gestalt center for 20 years, so I'm very experiential, you know, so, so I will put, you know, now everybody's on zoom, but if I'm with a, with a client, I'll put my hands up and say, put your hands on mine and push say no, push away and say, no, 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 in a strong way, which is not getting angry and throwing dishes, you know, but to just teach somebody. Um, I, I started a keto when I was like 59, you know, and I did it you know, for about five years until my knees gave out. But, but there's a lot that you can learn from martial arts in general, but a keto of just really learning how to, how to be, be grounded, be in your body, find that balance and take, take a stand from a sense of grounded strength and feel that energy come down. You know, if you put your leg behind you, kind of feel, feel a sense of your own strength without aggression, you know, and Jay and I have been working in the past couple of years in IFS, we talk about having the eight C's, which are the qualities of self. But we've been really looking um, a lot more at um, at more qualities and other capacities. And so in our work, uh, the way we teach and train is we teach a lot more about using capacities. I know EMDR kind of calls it calls resources, but we we might bring strength in. So if somebody if they're if the self isn't um, like a strong enough or, or or present enough, we might ask, you know, what what's the quality that's needed? Is it self-compassion? Is it focus? Is it strength? Is it um, inner support? You know, and then we might invite in that quality. You might invite it in by imagining that there's, um, you know, was there a time when you were strong? And if you can't find a time when you were strong in your life, was there somebody who you idealize or see as strong from your life or some literature movies whatever and you know if it's bringing in Samuel Jackson to kind of stand there and 
and and be there to support your protector to be strong. So, you know, you can bring in these capacities to kind of um, help help embody that quality in the person. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so great. And so it doesn't necessarily even need to be something you've fully embodied yourself up to that point, but a quality someone has or, or, or maybe someone in your life has had that and you, you're like, you can bring them in to support right. a part. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Wow, so I, the, the work seems so so rich and um and just very moving. It is is, moving. is there um is there bits about this process that you find more difficult than others, or is there ever? I'm I'm sure you've been doing it for so long. You're in your flow. <laughs> I'm in my flow most of the time. I love I love doing it, and and I the thing I love most is doing demonstrations. I really love. Um, in every class that I teach, you know, I do I do a demo at the end, and there's nothing I love more, you know, than just doing doing individual work with someone in front of a group, um, you know. And I have a whole bunch of videos if you want to, if people want to look, you know, contact me if anybody wants to watch. I have videos of those. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to link some stuff to the to, yeah. to, to the video for sure. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned uh well it's been the in the intro too about being uh in the Gestalt Center for 20 years. And then my, my question was sort of about pre-IFS, like what we where were you inclined to work before? Have you ever done like more cognitive stuff? Have you always been experienced? No, I mean that made sense to me. <laughs> I'm I'm too natural. <laughs> I'm too natural. There's a wonderful movie that I just saw on a plane called Be Natural, the untold story of um, Alice Guy Bliché. It's an amazing movie about the first filmmaker, the first woman filmmaker that whose work has gotten completely lost, but it's called Be Natural. So no, I'm too, I'm too interactive. I'm too open. So I started out when I was 21. My, I was headed for a P, I graduated college, was headed for a PhD program in psych and my dad died and um I wound up having to come back to New York and get a job and um anyway long story but but um I wound up getting involved in psychodrama and I was working as part of a a psychodrama team in kind of like a a, res, not, a non-residential therapeutic community where a therapist would kind of recommend um, of that this client needed a psychodrama to work on this piece of their dad. And then we would meet, you know, we would kind of meet as a team and set up a psychodrama and work work um, on that particular issue, kind of like a prescription from the therapist. It was fun. But what I learned from that, uh, the, the important lesson I learned that I walk away from and still teach is that when you do psychodrama, you know, you kind of set the person up to live in their the family, their, their world. And you have a part, which I was particularly good at, which is the alter ego, you know? So you kind of like walk around behind that person and that person is kind of interacting with their family or at the dinner table or something. And they're, they're saying what happens, you know, so they set up, here's the mother, the father. And so that the scene goes on and the person responds as themselves, but you stand behind them and you say, you know, like, so you say what's really going on inside of them, you know, so I spent about two or three years, you know, all day, every day on Saturday, kind of walking behind people saying what was really true, you know, and, um, and what, what you learn from doing that, you know, you learn to be sensitive and intuitive, but, but what you learn is that if you're right in what you say, the person picks it up and catches it, you know, so, so if they're saying to their mother, I can't give an example, saying to, to their mother, you know, thank you, mom, I really blah, blah, blah. And, and inside just saying, I hate when you say that to me, it makes me feel like shit, you know? And if you're right, the person will say like, yes, I hate that, it makes me feel like shit. And if you're wrong, they'll, they'll say, no, it makes me feel small. So that what I learned from that experience, which has been invaluable, is that if if you trust yourself with what you put out as a therapist and you're wrong and you're not attached to it, if you hold it like a feather in your hand and you're wrong, the person will correct you 
You know, they'll say, no, it's not that, but it's this. So I've learned not to be afraid of myself. I might say, and I never put things out like a psychoanalyst, like this is the truth, your mother, you're resisting, blah, blah, blah. But I, but I, I will put it out like, I will say, you know, something like, check this out or try this out or what do you think? Or maybe this is. So I put, if I put something out, I put it out as a possibility and the person can look at me and say, that's right. Or they can say, no, not that, but this, though it gives them a direction. And if I can hold it loosely or else they can say, no, this is it. But I can trust myself to be spontaneous as long as I'm not attached to what I'm saying. And I think this is where so many therapies go wrong, where, where you've got this, this, this power differential and the therapist is right and smart and knows things. It was your mother. No, it's not. It was your mother kind of thing. And as opposed to, I'm just here using, using my intuitive system and I don't really know you. And I always say, I can't tell really what's going on. But from over here, if it was me, this is what it feels like. And it allows the person to kind of take in that energetic, consider it, and then find their own truth. Yeah, I love it. It sounds um, some of the other experiential um, methodologies kind of have that same thing of like not um not interpreting or assuming that you know and it sounds like what you're saying is like maybe you're, you're you're sort of nudging the client either way to deepen into what's true for them like maybe you're right but maybe they go no it's actually this but you're not saying to them no it's all it's definitely this like you're <laughs> saying it's like let's try this on how is that feeling is that exactly where we're at right yeah, yeah. and yeah, well, hold it very lightly totally very lightly. I mean, I said, I said, I say this a lot, but it's, that's a, that's a relief from where I'm sitting to the therapist to be like, yeah, how can I know? Right. You don't have to be smart. You just have to be there. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just have to be there. And it sounds like you find these parts that say, you know, I don't, and uh, you know, like I should know this. I don't know what I'm doing. That was a stupid thing to say. You can just say, chill, give me space. That's not helpful. Right. And every piece of work that I do, and if you, you know, if, if, you, if you see my work, it looks brilliant, but I'm always sitting in a place of feeling like I have no idea what I'm doing. I have, and I'm, and there's always a part of me that says like, this is, this may go no place. And I, and I have to say to that part, leave it alone. It will happen. And I just trust that whatever will appear in front of me, I will be able to respond to in a way that I will know what to do next. And even if I've done the same kind of thing a hundred times, I can never assume with this client that it's going to go in this direction. So it's really sitting in not knowing is the biggest gift that any therapist can really have. Trusting not knowing and just being open and responding. That should be the first thing they tell you in grad school. It should be, right. It should be. And they don't. They say, learn this, take exams, do that. Mm -hmm. Give them this worksheet. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Matt, how long did it take you to be comfy with not knowing? (laughs) It gets better and better and better. It gets better and better. But you had a real... Yeah, the the more spiritual work I do, the more comfortable I am with not knowing. It's true. Yeah, yeah. And you really got to try that out live with the psychodrama of of trying to anticipate what the person was maybe right. feeling more implicitly in that moment and right. saying it and then having to let go of whether you're right or wrong. Right, right. If that's not it, something else will come, you know. And I'm mm-hmm. I'm a fountain of ideas, you know, like <laughs> there's, there's there's never a shortage of possibilities, mm-hmm. you know. But if you're if you're not worried about whether you're right or wrong you know then the ideas and the intuition keeps flowing the way to shut down your intuition is to feel like oh that was so stupid you know what was I thinking you know okay let it go what's what's next trust yourself so what you're you're saying like in those moments to uh connect briefly connect with that part and say don't worry about it just move aside we'll keep going yeah Yeah. I can trust myself, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. Good. Good. Well, this is so 
um, wonderful. And it sounds like you're such a just naturally creative person that this type of work was just where you were pulled Thank into. Um, I can't imagine you um, doing some cognitive stuff, just the, the way that you sort of talk about clients and the process and the sort of like trusting your intuition that the ideas are going to flow. Like, it seems like this is a really... You found your. I found my niche. I found it yeah. all. I found it when I was twenty-two. Right? Yeah, true. yeah. What would you? What sort of advice or guidance would you give people that have, you know, maybe out of college and they've sort of trained in the more behavioral stuff that want to do experiential stuff? Where would you? Where would you point them to? Go into therapy. Go go but, into go in go into I I would say IFS, but go into experiential therapy. You know. And I see it all the time because I, I teach a lot of professionals. You know, I teach a lot of um, CEU classes and professionals. And I see people who come in with, um, um, I have a, I have, I have a, a source for some of my classes at, and, and that there's a lot, like a lot of Orthodox, Orthodox Jews. And um, particularly the guys, they come in and they go like, oh, well, I don't know that I, my client, I don't know that my client would ever do that. And I don't know that it would do. And then they always are the first to volunteer to work as a demo. And when I do the work as a demo, they go like, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then they're converted, you know, they just absolutely, you know, you know, converted. They just are open and excited and, um, feeling like like something has been some constriction has been lifted and they can trust themselves and they can just go inside and be curious about what's here it's beautiful to watch I never get tired of it yeah well I think that's probably a testament to your ability to be in self with clients that are even apprehensive about the process you're probably so centered that they don't right. have a chance <laughs> right. not... well, I, well I say you know like I love the skeptics. I love the doubters. I always want them, give them a seat at the table. Give them a seat at the table. Bring them in. And the other piece that I teach, the other, the other little piece that I teach is that, is that the, the client has a self, but the system also has a self. So if you start out in a piece of work and there's like somebody got yelled at by their boss or something and you've got, you know, a part that's, angry and a part that's retributional and a part that's scared and a part that feels deficient and a part that feels like, you know, like, how can I go home and tell my wife, you know, whatever that is. And you've got like six or seven parts that you're starting with. And you're looking like, what's the target part that I'm going to work with is that if you bring all of those parts in and you bring those any parts in that Dick calls it a trailhead. So if you bring any parts in at a trailhead and then you ask the client, to step back so you step back in self and see there's like six parts at this trailhead and then ask the system what's the work to be done today what's the step towards the light so that the system has a wisdom that is its own innate understanding of how it is uh, constructed and the system will say, oh, work with these two. They're polarized. You know, we talk a lot about polarization. Like every, almost every part comes with an equal and opposite other part, even if you're not aware of it, you know. And then you work with those two polarized parts. Um, or the system might say, oh, work with that angry part, and then everybody else will quiet down. So it's really trusting that the system has a wisdom and you can access that wisdom. Wow, yeah, it just continues to sound really empowering. And you're not telling the client anything really except for to connect with the parts or maybe step back, let the system communicate with itself. Really, it's like, you, you're going to do it. I'm just going to be here. Which actually reminds me of, a, I've watched a few of Dick's um, uh, demos. And at the end, he says, often the feedback is the client will say, I didn't even really need you there. Right, 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 right. And that, and that means you've really done a good job. Mm -hmm. that means you've yeah. done it because you're not pulling it you know and that's the hardest thing to teach you know when I teach these CEU classes you know and I get really seasoned therapists you know we're very used to getting all that um all, all that neural feedback about them really liking you and really this you know this this interactive thing that feeds us 
you lose a little bit of that in IFS. You sit back because you're relating the client to their self. You know, so so people will start by doing that and then they get involved back in because they they're used to this is the relationship where I, the therapist, get a lot from. So so it's a shift into really trusting that being in self, feeling my feet. I do a lot in my classes. I don't do a lot in my sessions, but a lot in my classes of starting with some very deep meditations of grounding and centering so that they can really be in self and get that feeling to go back to so that that in itself becomes um, neurologically satisfying <laughs> as opposed to that interactive hit that we're most used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine that's uh, for some, for people who have been practicing a certain way for 20 years or so, I imagine switching to this could be a struggle, but that's I imagine true. your, your recommendation is the same. Go and go and, be a yeah. And of course, if they're in my classes there, I do demos in every class and I have them to people do homework with each other. So people are working every week in pairs, being the therapist, being the client so that they they come in, you know, they come in every week and they're like, I had the most amazing experience. And people will say to me at the end of my um, of my CEU classes, like I have done more work in this class than I have done in anything I've ever done before. You know, it's really a, a personal it's growth process. Wow, so powerful. I so even the training is experiential, like yes. having them. Absolutely. It's it's mm -hmm. the only real way to get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't just learn it from a book. You yeah. have to feel it inside. Well, that was going to be another one of my questions. I know you said there's like a 10,000 person waiting this to right. get into some of these trainings is there any places you could point people to if they want to like do some experiential training or the bonnie right yeah i mean there's, there's a bunch of people who do it but I, but but i certainly do it yeah. are you doing any in the states yeah coming up? it's all online sure i do i just i'm, I'm regularly doing i do a six-week basic class so it's a six-week online basic class two hours a week which really works with the, which works with this protector level because it's very, and then, and then I do a six week exiles class working with this uh, process for the exiles. Then I do a class on the inner critic. I do a class on legacy burdens. I do a class on polarization, I do a class on stories and, you know, do on teaching, but I basically do the basic and the exiles class because um, it's very easy for therapists when they start to learn IFS to feel like, okay, I just want to identify the protector, get that guy out of the way so I can heal the exile because that's where the juice is. So we spend six weeks on this on this relationship because build learning how to build and stay with this relationship between the protector and the self builds capacity and trust into the system. The work becomes more sustainable. It becomes more... Um, available to the client so that you're not just saying okay let's get rid of this guy and heal this guy this is an extremely important relationship and the process of learning how to really understand your parts and notice them in your life you know to be you know with your with your child and then flipping flipping into anger you know frustration about something and being able to say whoa that's just a part of me let me just give me a minute let me just be with that part ask it to calm down, feel my feet on the floor, put my hand on my belly, take a breath, come back and remember, I'm his father, I love him, I'm his mother, I want to be with him. You know, I have this, I have this client who was um, this, this young woman who had this very, very bright, uh, she's very smart, but a very, very bright little two-year-old. And he was just like running circles around her. And she was just flipping out and screaming and yelling and throwing and just really losing it every single day. And we just, we really just did a couple of sessions and she just got it and she taught it to him, you know? And so he would say to her, mommy, that's your angry part, you know? And when that angry part is there, I have an angry part too. You know, he just like, he became the therapist, this little two-year-old. He was like, mommy, there's that part again. <laughs> But it resolved it, you know, the two of them learned it and, you know, things really got better in a very short time. 
so brilliant. So it stopped being like, oh, mum's angry. And it so mum has an angry part and I have an angry part too. Right, right. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm conscious of our time. I don't want to go on too much longer, but I wanted to ask you. Um, well, yeah, actually, mention you. Fun. <laughs> I will. I will go dance anyway. I'm having fun. Go ahead. No, that yeah, me too. Me too. Um, because I, I actually have one of your books, which is I think it's the inner critic one. But I was just thinking about people yeah, who yeah. want to start doing this stuff and just try it out. I know some of your books are, are specifically for doing it yourself, right? Do you want to therapy? Yeah. And my self therapy workbook can really take you through a process. Yeah. So is that something that would be good to do alongside like being a client too? Or like, how would you? You could, you know, people, people are always recommending the books to clients because it, because the workbook is a nice, really way to work it. Um, but sure, you can, you can have a combination of, of working with the book and, uh, and being in therapy. It's great. 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 Well, this was so informative and I feel like I have a million more questions, um, but we're going to try and keep it to 60 minutes. But have you got any last minute nuggets for aspiring experiential therapists? You know, what comes to me, find a spiritual path that touches you. Um, I'm in the diamond work. I don't know if that means anything to anybody. I'm in Ridwan or the diamond heart work, which is just, I've been in that path for 30 some odd years. Um, so don't be afraid to get to know yourself. Um, do your own internal work. If you really want to do good work with clients, do your own internal work. And don't be afraid to have a spiritual um, path that supports um, going beyond the, the identity, the identity of who you are. Because that's the key. You know, when you can really sense your attachment to your identity and hold it very lightly then your whole life becomes easier <laughs> beautiful <laughs> it's a perfect story thank you babe but it's true no it's, uh, that's lovely it's like sort of letting you know letting go of ego and like what's what's right. what's underneath that like yourself and giving that self a voice is what's going to make you a better clinician right yeah Wow. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie. This was so okay. wonderful. Okay. And I appreciate your time so much. And uh, we'll link we'll link your stuff up to the video too, so people can check it out. And um and yeah, just thank you so much.